The gentleman from Texas is recognized for five Thank minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, listen, have there been any FISA orders or warrants obtained uh, to assist in the investigation of what happened to January 6th? So I, I, I think it, you can appreciate, Congressman, I, and not in a position to talk about any matters that occur before the FISA court involving the implementation of the... Well, the, the only Act way that we can have FISA. oversight to, dis, to discern whether or not that we should ever allow FISA to continue is if we find out what's been going on. And I was here beginning January of 05. We talked to lots of people from the Justice Department. We were assured nothing but foreign matters were going before the FISA court. So imagine the shock when we saw this uh, order from the FISA court, which basically, well not basically, it says that all call detail records uh, created by Verizon for communication between the United States and abroad, there's the foreign, or wholly within the United States, including local telephone calls, all had to be turned over. And as I understand, there are still orders similar to that that have a big net, and once that information goes into the database of your department, of the DOJ, of the NSA, then there are thousands of people that can access that and have access to that and done searches. So the question, when you have something that we're told is wholly domestic, that it's the domestic threat that's so serious, it is an important question to know whether you're using something called FISA, where the F stands for foreign, to go after American citizens. Because that, I can tell you, when I was here back in 06 and 08, we were taking these matters up. If people had known how badly that was being abused, there were people back then on both sides of the aisle who would have said, wait a minute, this is just being abused so much. So that's why it's a fair question to know in general, not specific cases, is the FISA court, has it been used to get orders to investigate January 6th? So uh, again, I, I'm not familiar with the order that you ref referred to a moment ago. Well, it was leaked, I think it was WikiLeaks, and that's what was so shocking to so many of us. And look, the abuses occurred during the Bush administration, the Obama administration, uh, there were some in the Trump administration, and I feel sure it's still going on. We need to know the extent of that. Well, let me ask you uh, about a, uh, a case. In Kilgore, Texas, uh, a lady there working for a private oil company got a, a text from her nephew. He had been looking through the FBI pictures and said, you recognize anybody in this picture? And it looked similar to her. And she did a LOL, you know, gee, that looks like me. Don't turn me in. A couple of days later, two FBI agents show up at her place of business demanding to know where she was on January 6th. She was in Kilgore, Texas. And then they threatened her boss that he could go to prison for covering for her. Is there any order from any court that allows the DOJ or the NSA to monitor text messages of American citizens? You know, uh, you know obviously there are court orders, whether they come from federal courts, not the FISA court, or the federal FISA court, uh, that authorize, pursuant to law, uh, search warrants and surveillance. Yes, but search warrants under the Fourth Amendment have to describe with particularity the things to be searched or seized, and that's not happening. That has not been happening. And so when you have no probable cause to go after somebody in Kilgore, Texas, then, you know, we'd heard about, oh, gee, there's software to look for specific words that allow you to go after 
anybody that hasn't committed crimes. We really need to know how widespread that is. Can you give us an answer? Is that being used? It's just really important to point out, sir, that the way the, the law works is that the federal judge, a federal FISA court judge, will only approve an order based on probable cause that an individual is an agent of a foreign Mr. power. Mr. Olson, we have proof that's a lie. Has expired. It has not Mr. been Mr. Raskin followed. is recognized for five minutes. Dr. Ray, we know from the Arizona case, the Supreme Court said that uh, state local law enforcement were not to enforce immigration laws, but isn't it true that local and state law enforcement officers can enforce state and local law if, uh, even if the, uh, the defendant is uh, in the country illegally? Well, I want to be a little bit careful since I, uh, the last time I looked at that issue was back in the uh, 2001, 2003 range when I was a, a lawyer at the Justice Department. But Look, my, recollection my time is, is very similar. short. My it's recollection an easy is question. Similar to yours. My, my recollection is similar to yours, but I'm yes. not speaking well, as a lawyer right now. Okay, it is the case, and I hope you'll refresh your recollection and your legal training. So uh, it seems that since the federal government is welcoming basically by its tactics, by its handling of the massive surge across our border um, in such a way to continue to encourage it that uh, uh, there is massive destruction to landowners' property. It sounds like understanding the criminal trespass laws of Texas that perhaps landowners on the border ought to have no trespassing signs, including in Spanish so that local law enforcement can protect the country um, while they're protecting local property owners. Uh, there was a question about uh, also the, um, the FISA court, and I'm still, as a former judge, particularly disturbed that no FISA judge um, felt strongly enough about uh, people not lying in applications for warrants that they took action for contempt of court, but should DOJ officials that sign applications for warrants before the FISA court actually read them before they certify that they're true and correct? Um, certainly it's my practice when, I, when as FBI director, I'm signing applications to- You do read, read them. them. I do review them, yes, absolutely. And I would commend you for that. And I would ask you to look in. They're not short, <laughs> by the way. Yeah, they're yeah. usually lengthy. Yeah. But I would uh, commend your looking into uh, Mr. Rosenstein's uh, inability to uh, testify that he uh, actually read those uh, regarding the Trump campaign before he signed them. Um, the night before January 6th, January 5th, that evening I was talking to Capitol Police officers and I said, you know, let's face it, uh, most of the conservatives that come, they don't have any intention of being violent. And they said, well, we've been briefed today that uh, there's a good bit of, uh, as I understood, online activity, that there are people that are gonna be coming that hate Trump, but they're gonna dress up in red, MAGA, Trump, paraphernalia to try to blend in and create trouble. Um, we had Capitol Police Chief Sun testify that uh, they got no information from U.S. Intel or from the DOJ, FBI, of any threat of the nature that came about. Did the FBI have information about the violent threat that occurred on January 6th, on January 5th? Well, the answer to that is complicated, unfortunately. So we have the, we've already talked about a little bit here this morning. It shouldn't be complicated. You either had information or you didn't. That was my question. Different, so there's different kinds of information. We had the online chatter that we just talked about and the Norfolk, so-called Norfolk SIR, Situational Information Report has that. But what we did not have, to my did knowledge. Did you pass any of that information on to Chief uh, Sund? 
We passed the Norfolk information onto the Capitol Police in three different ways, uh, as well as to- Okay, MPD. well you were careful to note that most of the protesters who were left this last summer uh, were basically peaceful, but you haven't said that about the 100, 200,000 people that showed up on January 6th. Do you know how many people actually came into the Capitol on January 6th uh, that were unauthorized? I don't have an exact number. I do know that we've uh, now uh, are approaching around 500 arrests. But to be clear, to your point about peaceful, the way I, I think is a fair description of January 6th is there's sort of three groups of people, almost like an inverse pyramid. First group, biggest number of people who showed up kind of outside, maybe not on the Capitol grounds, uh, were peaceful, maybe rowdy, but peaceful protesters. Then there's a second group that were people who, uh, for whatever reason, engaged in, let's say, the next level of criminal conduct, trespass, et cetera. Uh, and that is criminal, that is a violation, and it needs, those laws need to be enforced. And then there's the third group, uh, which is where you're seeing a lot of the arrests and a lot of the more significant charges that are coming out of our work right now, which are the people who brought all sorts of weapons, uh, you know, Kevlar, tactical vests, uh, you know, bear spray. Firearms? What's that? Anybody bring yeah, yeah, firearms? We, Gentlemen. Uh, do we have, I can think of at least one instance where there was an individual with a gun inside the Capitol, but for the most part, the weapons were weapons other than firearms. But General, there's three groups, and it's hard to paint with one broad brush every single individual. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Cohen. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 4th, 2021, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gohmert, for the remainder of the hour as a designee of the Minority Leader. The gentleman from Texas has approximately 28 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We had a bill we took up the last vote of the day before we're out for October. And it was strange because this bill got rushed to the floor. Uh, the people, I can't find anybody on our, our side of the aisle that had any idea this was coming until uh, yesterday afternoon. And it's interesting though, it is entitled Fairness for 9-11 Families Act. And it makes uh, 2.982, right, at $3 billion available for 9-11 families. Well, you know, there's been a lot of money provided in the past, but it's interesting because just last week I was talking about this article from September 12th, Greenfield, Daniel Greenfield, um, about what the Biden administration was doing in battling against 9-11 victims' families in court because uh, there was $7 billion of Afghanistan assets or bank funds, you know, liquid money, uh, funds in the bank in America that were frozen after 9-11, when we found out who was responsible. And uh, the 9-11 victims, families, have sued, and they had gotten a judgment against the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and Iran for $6 billion. So, as this article points out, uh, White House Democrats have a history of fighting against terror victims who are suing Islamic terrorists. The Obama administration battled American terror victims suing the PLO. In 2015, after they won a 218 million judgment against the terror group, Blinken, then only a deputy secretary of state, intervened claiming that the lawsuit threatened, quote, several decades of U.S. foreign policy, unquote. In other words, 
took up for the terrorists against the victim families. The article points out, but now Biden administration fighting 9-11 victims on behalf of the Taliban. At stake are billions of dollars being held by the Afghan Central Bank Fund in the United States. So further down, it points out, since Afghanistan has assets in this country, the United States, including $7 billion in bank funds, it's now entirely possible for the victims to collect that money. Biden officially announced that he was splitting the $7 billion between the families of the victims and a trust fund to provide, quote, humanitarian aid, unquote, for the people of Afghanistan. And for those that don't understand international relationships, uh, when the Biden administration says it's for humanitarian aid, what it means is they got to give that money to the Taliban and trust that the people that have lied and killed Americans and killed 13 Americans on the very day that the Biden administration had that ridiculous hasty retreat, uh, you're going to trust them? Are you kidding me? This, it, it's just so outrageous. The article points out the three and a half billion dollars was placed in a separate trust that would be separate and distinct from around 800 million the Biden administration has already spent on aid to Afghanistan. Wasn't enough that this administration was left 80, 85 billion dollars worth of military equipment that they could use to attack us later. They've been sending millions of dollars over there. Like that's going to really go to help the people. The article points out what Biden actually did was take money off the table for the 9-11 victims and it got worse. On the same day as Biden's executive order reserving three and a half billion for the terrorists, his Justice Department filed a statement of interest in court arguing that the judgment for the victims of terrorism here in the United States was too large and that actually turning over the money to those victims in America would interfere with the Biden administration's foreign policy in Afghanistan. Like we've got a foreign policy in Afghanistan? Who believes that? This administration tucked tail and ran, and ran so fast it exposed our military, our people, our allies to death. Policy in Afghanistan, for heaven's sake. Article points out, now a magistrate judge has re repeated back much of the Department of Justice's arguments and ruled for the Biden administration that the 9-11 families who were laying claim to the other half of the $7 billion, that $3.5 billion, were not entitled to it. If it weren't for the Biden administration going to court and fighting against the 9-11 victims' families, there would have been three and a half billion dollars. And this is not just some speculation. That's money in the bank. This is liquidity. This is, this is money that's there. And the Biden administration has been fighting them in court to keep them from getting that three and a half billion dollars with a B that the Biden administration wants to give to the Taliban for quote, humanitarian aid, unquote. No, the Taliban is more likely to, to torture and kill as they have done anybody that was our ally than provide true humanitarian aid. To them, humanitarian aid is treating women like property, preventing them from having education, which was improving, and killing those with whom they disagreed. This, it's just tragic. 
So, oh, and if there's any doubt about uh, who would get the money, the deputy governor of the bank that this will go through is a Taliban leader who we have listed specifically as a global terrorist. And that's who the Biden administration wants to help. So it shouldn't have been a surprise. I talked about this here on the House floor last week, that the Biden administration was fighting our own 9-11 victims, trying to keep them from getting reimbursement from the terrorists. So what happens? The last thing, here we come, running in here. Oh, 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 uh, we don't want the 9-11 family's too mad at us. Uh, let's take three billion dollars that American taxpayers have paid and give that to the 9-11 victims instead of the three and a half billion dollars that belongs to the Taliban, we're told by this administration. Well, I think most Americans, if they knew that this had gone on, would say, this is crazy. You actually want to give the people responsible for killing 3,000 Americans three and a half billion dollars so that you can take taxpayer money from Americans and give that for the damages that the terrorists did? That, that makes no sense, but it does explain why the last bill for the next month and a half was $3 billion of taxpayers' money that the Biden administration wants to use instead of the $3.5 billion that they say they need to send to the terrorists, the Taliban in Afghanistan. It was bad enough that this administration deserted our allies in Afghanistan and left them to be massacred by the evil within the Taliban. And now they want to give the terrorists even more money. I mean, at least you would have thought somebody in this administration would have said, you know what, we left them $85 billion of military equipment uh, I think they can get three billion out of that and pay that would pay the victims of 9-11. But this administration, $85 billion of equipment they left with them, has added 800 million of American taxpayer dollars sent over there to the Taliban for humanitarian aid, yeah, right. It, it, and now they want to give three billion more of taxpayer money instead of terrorist money, give that to 9-11 victims. So uh, I think there were 30 or so Republicans that voted against this, and anybody who tries to say they don't care about 9-11 victims is a liar, because they do. And that's why we've appropriated billions of dollars for them. But in this case today, if everyone on this floor, I can't help but think if everybody on both sides of the aisle, well, I know some would have known, but if they had known there was three and a half billion from the terrorists own money in our banks we could give to the 9-11 uh, victims, then they would say, you know, that's probably a better idea than taking it from American taxpayers. That is outrageous. Now, shifting to what's going on in our Department of Justice. We've been seeing these tactics that have been coming for some years. And People know that there was some corruption within J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. People should have gone to prison from within the DOJ for what they did to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
to the point not only did they harass him, spy on him illegally, but even send him messages that he needed to kill himself. I mean, we know it's been bad in the past, but most of us felt like there have been great strides forward to the point that in the 80s and 90s, if you ask people around the world, they would say the FBI is probably the greatest law enforcement entity in the world. That's not the case anymore. And some of the first people that will tell you that are people that are working for the FBI, but they have to be very careful. But I've heard from FBI agents, former FBI agents, people that have been around a while, they say, one of them said, you, you remember the way it, it used to be? The FBI was a class organization. And we knew if there was a defendant who was nonviolent, that, and, and I remember this happening before I went on the bench as a judge and then during my years on the bench as a district judge, I, I knew of cases, the FBI knew they were nonviolent, white collar crime, even though they were very, very serious felonies, they'd call the guy's lawyer and say, you need to show up at the jail at this time, you've been indicted or you will be indicted. And they knew they would show up because otherwise, you know, they might come knock down the door. But that was not what they did. That was not their practice. They believed in civility and humanity. So I've been thinking about the intimidation tactics that have been used by the FBI. And, and there was no other reason but intimidation. And I think Merrick Garland, through some of the things he and Christopher Ray have said, they've made clear, you know, they're out to intimidate conservatives. And they've done a good job. Many are afraid to speak up about the improprieties that are going on within the FBI and the DOJ, even to the point that the head of the Department of Justice, the Attorney General himself, who was nominated for the Supreme Court, thank you, God, that he's not there. But he's at a place he can do a lot of damage to people's rights, and he has. But he issued an order that DOJ, FBI, they were not to speak to a member of Congress or the Senate without going through the FBI. And I've heard from people that, that have complained about what's going on in DOJ and FBI. And they talk about how Christopher Wray has talked repeatedly using this line, protect the brand, protect the brand. And from the things that he would say, they tell me, he made it clear, we're not asking you to be honest and truthful. We're asking you when you find something that is criminal wrongdoing within the FBI, don't tell anybody, just pass it up the chain of command. Let's keep it in-house because if people find out about corruption inside the FBI or the DOJ, then it hurts our brand. Christopher Ray and Merrick Garland apparently don't understand the damage that they have done to the brand of the FBI and the DOJ. And for the Attorney General, knowing the Constitution and knowing this body's right of oversight and knowing that everybody inside and outside the Department of Justice has a constitutional right to talk to their member of Congress without going through Merrick Garland's screeners. And yet he orders that they don't have the constitutional rights they've got because he thinks his orders take precedence over the U.S. Constitution. And why wouldn't he think that? Because they have been giving orders that take precedence over the Constitution. So 
I've been thinking, there's so much in the way intimidation tactics being utilized by the FBI and the DOJ. It's that that's exactly what the tactics were of a group that people understood. They were all about intimidation. And we hear comparisons. People say, oh, Donald Trump is like Hitler. Really? He wants more participation. He wants to have more rights back at the states. He wants to spread out the power of the government. And that, the left thinks, is like Hitler. No, that's not. But when you have a law enforcement, a so-called justice department, that is using the exact same tactics as the Gestapo, then you need to understand your republic, or a democratic republic as it's often referred to because we elect representatives but then have representatives represent our servants of the people. So it's a republic democratically elected, but it's in jeopardy and ours is. When the DOJ gets this powerful. Now, there were some that were extremely upset about uh, what happened on 9 11, like all Americans were. But they were concerned about what they saw as infringements on liberty within a month after 9 11. And they have been talking about those for years now. But it has really come into focus in recent days as the FBI has knocked down doors, leaked information to media so that they're there to film people when they drag them out in their underwear. In cases, not even giving them a chance to put on clothes. Contrast that to the same treatment they would have gotten back in the 80s or 90s of telling them they need to report to the jail a certain day, certain time. So I don't use the term Gestapo lightly. And having felt this, that why, why is our Justice Department feeling like they got to be like the Gestapo? I greatly admired the FBI when I saw the way they worked in the 80s and 90s, so professional. And then along came Mueller in 2001 as the new director of the FBI. And he started a policy that allowed the FBI to run off thousands and thousands and thousands of years of experience because he wanted nothing but young yes people working at the FBI. And so over the years, those people that would have said, excuse me, I know you think that's a good idea, but let me tell you what happened when we tried that before, or let me tell you where that's going and why it's not a good idea. They didn't want those people in. They wanted be if they wanted to go after a candidate like Donald Trump, they wanted people around them that would say, okay, here's how we can do it. We can do this secretly and we can do this and that violates the Constitution, we don't care. We need an insurance policy to keep Trump from getting elected. And if he gets elected, we need to violate more rights and we need to have people working for the Justice Department that will lie in an affidavit. I'm telling you, that's why when I saw the lack of response or appropriate response from the FISA courts when they found out that the FBI, the DOJ lied to them and then kept filing for a warrant every 90 days, basing it back on a lie. Those FISA judges should have been outraged. The chief justice across the street of our Supreme Court should have been outraged. And they weren't. And they really didn't do anything. The state district judges I know and the former federal judges 
federal district judges I practiced in front of trying cases, I couldn't imagine them not calling a lawyer in and finding them in contempt because it was done in their presence and sending them to jail for six months before any criminal prosecution even took place and then demanding that there be criminal prosecution. That didn't happen. So it tells you something about the FISA courts. We learned, I believe it was 2007, that the national security letters that give the FBI the ability to just send a letter like a warrant saying produce all the records you have on this individual, that individual, and by the way, it's a federal felony if you tell anybody that you got this letter. And the IG did an inspection and ultimately said, eh, there are probably 3,000 or so national security letters that were sent out by the FBI when there was no case, there was no probable cause, they were just doing fishing expeditions. That's unconstitutional. And we would have hoped that got cleaned up, but we had an FBI director named Mueller that kept adding to the problems. And instead of punishing the FBI agent that fabricated a case against Ted Stevens as Republican senator, the one that brought forward the fraud by the FBI, he gets run out of the FBI. And the one that was involved in the fraud got promotion, got a better job. So that tells you, even back not long after Mueller took over at the FBI, he was involved in intimidation. And really, I felt it ever since. We know that William Jefferson was a criminal, committed a crime, and was punished as he should have been. But when the FBI under Mueller he, Mueller made clear, this is intimidation to Congress. You better not mess with me or counter me or have legitimate oversight over what I'm doing or I may just come search your office. Well, they did. Never been done before that. But it was all about members of Congress concerned about what was happening at the FBI, abuses of our Constitution, so he shoves it right back in our face. It's intimidation. These are Gestapo-type tactics. And there was an article that was written in the Eurasia Review uh, back September 1 of this year, and it expressed the concern I have entitled the FBI's Gestapo Tactics, Hallmarks of an Author Authoritarian Regime. And it talks about with every passing day, the United States government borrows yet another leaf from the Nazi uh, Germany playbook. Secret police, secret courts, that's, we have FISA, and I'm fine if we get rid of them. We, we had national secrets that were kept before FISA. But the abuses and the lack of concern about the abuses by the judges tell me we need to get rid of them. It says secret government agencies, surveillance, censorship, intimidation, harassment, torture, brutality, widespread corruption. And look, if that power's there and Republicans take over and put staunch conservatives in there, you know, we still would need very, very stringent oversight so that nobody did that to the Democrats. Because it, when it happens to one side, it should concern everybody. I got really upset when I found out about the abuses of the national security letter, and that was under the Bush administration. And I was calling it out, I was angry about it, and I'm not hearing any Democrats concerned about the abuses of the Constitution that have gone on, the intimidation, that borrowing pages directly from the Gestapo. This is how you intimidate people. Well, this is very serious. And I don't have time to go into all of this. It's a good article from Eurasia Review, but it goes and documents 
what the Gestapo did and what the FBI is doing, and it's scary. And I hope that if Democrats are not willing to address this issue now, then surely they will be when we have a Republican administration because the abuse needs to stop. With that, I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back for what purposes, Mr. Government seek recognition. Back the last word. Chairman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't think uh, that it's very effective for the children to have people on the other side of the aisle come in and accuse Republicans of being complicit in murder and that we put our right to kill over others' right to live to infer by rhetorical supposed questions, who are you here for? We must be here for the gunman is an outrage. How dare you? You think we don't have hearts? It's just that when we look at the things that you're doing and you're trying to do to America, we've seen the carnage. I mean, for heaven's sake, let's, let's take example. Democrats control the major cities that have the worst murder rates. That's right. Your ideas have been shown to get people killed. Are you here for the murders, the murderers in Chicago, in Philadelphia, in these other major cities? Because you're wanting to do nationally what is being done by Democrats in those big cities. We care about people. We care about their lives. And lives have been so trivialized. We care deeply. How dare you? How dare you? You arrogant people attributing murder to those of us that want to do things to stop it because we've seen what your ideas do. They create more murder. Okay, let's look. Rochester, New York. These are cities that set the all-time high homicide rates in 2021. This is what you're shooting for, apparently, figuratively speaking. Rochester, New York. Uh, they had a record homicide rate of 80, not that big of a city. Philadelphia, 524 last year. Uh, and by the way, all of these are, are Democrat mayors. Louisville, Kentucky hit a homicide, high homicide rate. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Austin, Texas, Indianapolis, St. Paul, Portland, Albuquerque, Tucson, Columbus, Jackson, Mississippi, Atlanta, New Haven, those were all Democrat ideas. They control. They've done so many of the things that Democrats in this committee want to do. We're not alleging you don't care. We're just telling you that your ideas have gotten people killed, not saved lives, for heaven's sake. And then you want to be arrogant and accuse us of murder and of not caring? We care. And if, if you could just possibly get off any kind of arrogant stepladder that allows you to look down on us and look back historically. Thomas Jefferson was not at the Constitutional Convention, but, but he said in a letter, if I could change one thing, it would be to require bills to be on file for a year before they're voted on because he understood the mistakes that are made when you rush and make big decisions out of emotion. That's what we're trying to prevent so that we can save lives and keep people from being killed. For heaven's sake, I, I, I think back historically, we had a president in Franklin Roosevelt that on D-Day led the country in a six to eight minute prayer for our troops. And now we had a president come on after Uvalde and, and he used God's name in vain. Most of us would consider it. It was used as an interjection 
not as a source from whom to beg for wisdom like this country did for most of our history. And since the 60s, we really started having these mass shootings. Perhaps there was something in the 60s, maybe some Supreme Court decisions that gave rise to people being taught in school. It's whatever you think feels good. Well, it's time to get common sense back and to look historically about where people are being murdered in record rates and don't repeat that like the Democrats are trying to do. Let's do common sense things that will save lives. I'm out of time, so you're back. Mr. Yeah. Gohmert. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Mayorkas, uh, in a meeting some of us had with you April 5th, uh, you agreed to find out who gave the order to prevent members of Congress like me from going undeterred to the border to see for ourselves what has happened. Did you find out where that came from? Because the region said, the regional director said it came from Washington. Uh, Congressman, uh, I have inquired, and I'm not aware of any such order. I was not able to identify any such order. And in fact, um, of course, quite a number of CODELs have occurred right. since you and I uh, met in April. Right, but those normally uh, they are escorted where they're allowed to see instead of like those of us that have oversight of Border Patrol. We like to go down and just see for ourselves, no dog and pony tour, but see for ourselves what's happening. And you agree that is appropriate, correct? Yes. Uh, 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 Congressman, there are certain parameters, uh, quite frankly, for the safety and well-being of those uh, who wish to tour the border. So but for, for a example, member of Congress that wants to go down, as I've done for the last 17 and a half years, uh, we have to understand we assume the risk when we get there. So I'll make sure I have a recording of you indicating that it's it's okay for whom, whomever uh, has been given that kind of order. Now, we heard the chairman say the prior administration dismantled the immigration system. He said the prior administration did all they could to destroy the immigration system. He said they implemented a Muslim ban, and so we can set the record straight. And I know it's not intentional misleading, but even the courts have made clear there was no Muslim ban. Muslims were allowed in. There were specific countries that had... Uh, extraordinary numbers of terrorists, those were the countries uh, where there was a ban. There was no Muslim ban. Uh, so when I do want to know, though, you, you say immigrants are placed in immigration proceedings, but you didn't say where they go during those proceedings. Uh, they remain in the United States. When you say somebody's placed in immigration proceedings and then you further clarified that some are detained, if they're not detained, the vast majority go released around the country, correct? Uh, uh, no, um, uh, quite a, a significant number are placed on alternatives to detention. Uh, we uh, use the acronym ATD. There are different levels of alternatives to detention, depending on the risk profile. But you that the ship individual. many of those people that are not detained in these other categories around the country, correct? Uh, yes, on um, alternatives to detention. And that's can, one of the things involve, you're looking to increase the money for is to pay NGOs and to have your own uh, folks who can help get those people shipped around the country, correct? Uh, uh, Congressman, if I can uh, explain. You, you have uh, asked for an increase in that amount of money, correct? Yes, yes we have. And so I want to know, though, who makes the decision where these different bus loads, plane loads, train loads, who makes the decision where they are going to go in the country? So, Congressman, uh, there are different tiers of disposition depending on the risk profile. I want to know who makes I'm, those determinations. I just want to know who makes the determinations. I don't have time for filibustering. Uh, no, no, Congressman, I'm trying to answer your question. Yeah, about who a, makes that determination in those categories? Your Honor, um, uh, Your Honor uh, that's my days as a prosecutor. Um, Congressman, um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement makes a determination 
subject an immigration court judge as to who is placed in, in Who detention. makes that decision and in ICE? Um, the ICE personnel with expertise make a decision with respect to who should be detained. Wow, it sounds like what a smart level. chamber. We don't get to know who is making the decision to send people to these neighborhoods. Well, I only got 27 seconds. Let me just say, uh, the, as you know, Article 4, Section 4 uh, it says the federal government is going to keep the states free from invasion. That hadn't happened. You know, there was... Uh, Pancho Villa's guys in 1916, they came in and killed 19, 18, 19 people in New Mexico. That was considered an invasion. We're losing 100,000 a year. What will be time your of the response the time of the gentleman has expired. when Texas the time of the gentleman the invasion? The time of the gentleman has expired, Mr. You, sir, you oh, allowed two minutes beyond your time my limit policy, to let the my witness policy, answer the question. Me, let me explain exactly what I'm doing so everybody knows. Okay. Okay. If someone has asked the question before the clock expires, do I let the witness answer it. The majority if, of the question was if asked. The, if the witness is in the process of answering a question, I let him finish. You've heard me say the, witness, the, the time of the gentleman or gentlelady has expired, the witness may answer the question. Correct. You weren't asking a question. Yes, I was. You were stating a fact. There was no question. What is the question in front of? So that's why I cut it off at that point. Mr. Cohen seeks recognition. What, what purpose does Mr. Fitzgerald seek recognition? Gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate my friend Mr. Ben's uh, yielding. Um, we heard from the other side, when a judge says there's probable cause here and issues a warrant, you know that it's there. Well, I've been a judge, I've been a chief justice, and I know that's not the case. That's, uh, that's why we have appellate courts, and that's also uh, particularly true when it comes to the persecution of candidate Donald Trump and President Donald Trump. Uh, we went for years uh, before we found out the true basis of the six warrants uh, it was based on garbage, lies. There was no probable cause there. And we found out uh, we had FBI agents lying, even though one's been found not guilty. The jury said, well, they didn't. Since everybody lies to the FBI, it shouldn't be a crime. Well, that's here in D.C., uh, and that's a Democrat. A Republican, of course, would be convicted of that. But uh, that's why our job is so important, because judges are not p perfect. And let me just read you. After the deputy director of the FBI that all of a sudden my Democrat friends are s such huge fans of. Oh, and by the way, uh, this information about the FBI hiring a Putin lackey, uh, Danchenko, uh, that didn't come out in the Mueller report. So they either hid it or were incompetent in finding it. It didn't come out in the IG investigation. So he was either incompetent or just actually hid it. Uh, and it takes a special counsel two years after President Trump's out of office to finally reveal what happened six years ago in the Department of Justice dishonesty. And so let me just read from this uh, letter uh, dated September 11th after the deputy director said, oh, no, no, there were no violations of security that compromised security. It says, by issuing an absolute denial of your misconduct, talking in the letters to Deputy Director Paul Abadi, uh, you also implicitly claimed that the two individuals who reported the misconduct made false statements. That assertion is false. Thinking back, you are certainly aware that many of your subordinates saw you wearing the phone in the skiff. Now your subordinates are coming forward and their reports are far more damning to you and Mr. Ray, 
you, Mr. Ray, and the employees on the seventh floor violated national security because you were all too lazy to secure your devices. You failed to set the example, and now you've become the example of what's wrong with the FBI. I was talking to an FBI, actually multiple FBI agents, but a former FBI agent said, you remember back in the 80s and 90s, if we needed somebody to report we had an indictment, we would call their lawyer and say, you need to report at 9 or 10 or 1. Tomorrow we have an indictment, and they would show up to jail because they knew if they didn't, they'd come pick them up at home. What that's turned into now is, is it's actually the, the tactics that Gestapo used. Middle of the night, wee hours of the morning, you bust in, you drag them out of bed, and you don't let them even put on clothes. What happened? to the FBI. They, you drag them out in front of CNN or some other liberal media that you leaked the information illegally to before you did the search and so that they could film it in their underwear. What happened to our Justice Department? That was not the way they were. They, they, they had some decency about them, but they become so political. And I, I know if it ever turned around and it was Democrats. Yes, I would be upset about that, like I was about uh, criminal William Jefferson's activity, but the way he was treated and the violation here, and not one person on the Judiciary Committee has complained about a member of Congress's phone that has privileged information on it not going and being screened by House Counsel before it's grabbed by the FBI. You are putting this body in jeopardy by not standing up for civil rights. And I appreciate my colleague. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose is Mr. Ice? The gentlewoman yields back. I now recognize uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and appreciate your being here. Looks like we may be last or maybe somebody else to ask questions, but uh, uh, there was an internal review done at the FBI in 2019 uh, to gauge compliance with FBI rules for handling high-profile, delicate cases known as sensitive investigative matters, SIMS, generally involve activities of domestic public officials, political candidates, religious organizations, and the FBI's audit turns out found that uh, in auditing 353 cases, there were 747 compliance errors in violation of FBI rules. To your knowledge, were any aspects of those 353 cases handled by the Cyber Division? Uh, sir, to the best of my knowledge, there were a handful of cyber cases that were part of that audit. Well, I know, um, Jamie, well, members of Congress, Jamie Raskin and Nancy Mays had requested a review of the FBI's domestic operation. Uh, will the Cyber Division comply with that request? Sir, are you referring to the, the DIOG, the Domestic Operations Guide? Well, I'm not sure. they had made a request to review domestic operations, so. I'm, I'm, any any request that's supported by the department and by the director of the FBI, I obviously will support. Well, then I guess that's the question. Are they supporting? Uh, question is, would you support them to the director? Sir, I'd be happy to take back your request. I'm actually not familiar with what you're referring okay. to. Uh, and I'm not asking for any specifics, just numbers. But how many cyber cases have been have involved warrants for surveillance of any American citizens from the FISA court? Sir, I, I couldn't even hazard a guess. I apologize. So there'd be a lot. Of US citizens? Right. Sir, I, I, I don't know that answer off the top of my head. I apologize. Well, how about generally speaking? More than a thousand? No, sir. Less than a thousand? I, my best guess would be absolutely the latter. 
Uh, do you know if there's been any internal review like that one that we just found out about it from 2019? Has there been any internal audit for 2020, 2021? Not that I'm aware of, sir. Okay. Um, the cybercrime website on FBI.gov says the FBI is the lead agency for investigating cyber attacks and intrusions, and the division collects and shares intelligence and engages with victims while working to unmask those committing malicious cyber activities. Um, according to the, a Department of Justice audit in 2017, the FBI disrupted or dismantled 262 high-level criminal operations targeting global U.S. interests. Um, in 2014, we know that the cyber crimes disrupted, your division disrupted 2,492, but in 2017, just 262. Um, has the track record improved since 2017? Um, what was the reason for having so few compared to what your division's done before that? Yeah, I'm, I'm unsure about the 2014 number and what that is or isn't referencing. Um, <clears throat> more concerned about 2017 when you didn't disrupt too many. About yeah, I guess, if I, I guess my point though would be like, I'm unsure of how the metrics were pulled in 2014 on that okay. website. Well, um, if but you don't know, but I would sure like to find out, and I'd like to yield the rest of my time to Mr. Jordan. I, I thank the gentleman from, uh, for, for yielding. Um, uh, Mr. Pondran, uh, were you involved in the original indictment and prosecution of Alexei Burkhoff? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Are you I'll yield back to the gentleman. Okay, uh, just quickly, does Cybercrime Division pay informants as part of the cybersecurity investigations? Sir, um, I'm not going to go into specifics about our source operational activity. Well, I just ask a general question, do you? I understand. That is always an option that we would consider if the circumstances are appropriate. Okay. My time's expired. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Gomez seek recognition? Strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. We were told we want to fix the problems, we would support this bill. The truth is, if we want to fix the problem, we would secure the border. You're creating, with this bill, more of a draw into this country. Bad enough you're talking about ending Title 42, which will add hundreds of thousands of people coming It'll bring them coming quicker. But now we're told, and it really is analogous to, you, you're going to make the hole bigger in our boat, and we're going to fix it by having more efficient buckets to bail out the situation. It doesn't work that way. This bill will create even more money for the drug cartels to corrupt the government, corrupt local, state, federal government in Mexico. And now I'm finding out from law enforcement in Texas, they're setting up in Texas. We've heard that there's drug cartel employees all over the country. And the border patrolmen over the last several years, they say, you know, they call us the logistics the drug cartels get people across the border, and then the federal, the U.S. government ships them to cities all over the country where the drug cartels want them to work so they can finish paying off the money they agreed to pay in order to come into the country illegally. You know, those who want to make this a Marxist totalitarian government and there are plenty of them in this country, they know that first you destroy a knowledge of history, you create some chaos, and then just as Lenin did, couldn't have done it without Trotsky, but they come riding in and say, we're the answer, 
we will bring about peace. We'll get this under control. But in the chaos, it normally takes a totalitarian, dictatorial, no, sir, uh, government in order to overcome the chaos that the Marxists created <laughs> in order to get control. You know, I'm hearing from people all over the world, have been for some time, we see what you're doing and you're making matters worse in your country and we're getting desperate because all of us see and we know that when you lose your freedom in America, there will be no place left to go. You're the last place we can count on. And we see the world falling apart. And what are we going to do? We're going to process people more quickly. And I heard from uh, a union leader this morning here in D.C. And he was saying about the northern border that not only are we pulling our border patrolmen away from the southern border just to process people full time, now we're bringing them from the northern border, and we have hundreds of miles where there is no one, and our enemies know that, and drug cartels know that, and now it won't be long before the northern border is a big problem. Look, when you don't stop the flood but make the hole bigger, we're going to get to the place where it's irreparable and we're going to lose our country keep hearing from Democrats, gee, the, and I'm quoting, the last administration politicized and dismantled our immigration system. Well, they were securing the border, and they were doing so more effectively than anybody since I've been in Congress. The reason Mexico's not a top economy is the corruption from the drug cartels, and America is complicit, and we're complicit in sending the money to Mexico that is bringing drugs in that are killing tens of thousands of Americans every year. I mean, we're seeing this place fall apart, and you want to condemn us for saying, let's secure the border, and then we can fix the immigration system. That is the clear solution and i hope you will join us in Time eventually coming around to securing the, the border expired. yield back uh, for what purpose is mr christopher ray and merrick garland apparently don't understand the damage that they have done to the brand of the fbi and the doj and for the attorney general knowing the Constitution and knowing this body's right of oversight and knowing that everybody inside and outside the Department of Justice has a constitutional right to talk to their member of Congress without going through Merrick Garland's screeners, and yet he orders that they don't have the constitutional rights they've got because he thinks his orders take precedence over the U.S. Constitution. And why wouldn't he think that? Because they have been giving orders that take precedence over the Constitution. So I've been thinking there's so much in the way intimidation tactics being utilized by the FBI and the DOJ. It's that... That's exactly what the tactics were of a group that people understood. They were all about intimidation. And we hear comparisons. People say, oh, Donald Trump is like Hitler. Really? He wants more participation. He wants to have more rights back at the states. He wants to spread out the power of the government, and that, the left thinks, is like Hitler? No, that's not. But when you have a law enforcement, a so-called justice department, that is using the exact same tactics as the Gestapo, then you need to understand your republic 
or a democratic republic, as it's often referred to, because we elect representatives, but then have representatives represent our servants of the people. So it's a republic democratically elected, but it's in jeopardy, and ours is. When the DOJ gets this powerful. Now, there were some that were extremely upset about uh, what happened on 9-11, like all Americans were. But they were concerned about what they saw as infringements on liberty within a month after 9-11. And they've been talking about those for years now. But it has really come into focus in recent days as the FBI has knocked down doors, leaked information to media so that they're there to film people when they drag them out in their underwear. In cases, not even giving them a chance to put on clothes. Contrast that to the same treatment they would have gotten back in the 80s or 90s of telling them they need to report to the jail a certain day, certain time. So I don't use the term Gestapo lightly. And having felt this, that why, why is our Justice Department feeling like they got to be like the Gestapo? I greatly admired the FBI when I saw the way they worked in the 80s and 90s, so professional. And then along came Mueller in 2001 as the new director of the FBI. And he started a policy that allowed the FBI to run off thousands and thousands and thousands of years of experience because he wanted nothing but young yes people working at the FBI. And so over the years, those people that would have said, excuse me, I know you think that's a good idea, but let me tell you what happened when we tried that before, or let me tell you where that's going and why it's not a good idea. They didn't want those people in. They wanted be If they wanted to go after a candidate like Donald Trump, they wanted people around them that would say, okay, here's how we can do it. We can do this secretly, and we can do this and that violates the Constitution, we don't care. We need an insurance policy to keep Trump from getting elected. And if he gets elected, we need to violate more rights and we need to have people working for the Justice Department that will lie in an affidavit. I'm telling you, that's why when I saw the lack of response or appropriate response from the FISA court when they found out that the FBI, the DOJ lied to them and then kept filing for a warrant every 90 days, basing it back on a lie. Those FISA judges should have been outraged. The chief justice across the street of our Supreme Court should have been outraged. And they weren't. And they really didn't do anything. The state district judges I know and the former federal judges, federal district judges I practiced in front of trying cases, I couldn't imagine them not calling a lawyer in and finding them in contempt because it was done in their presence and sending them to jail for six months before any criminal prosecution even took place and then demanding that there be criminal prosecution. That didn't happen. So it tells you something about the FISA courts. We learned, I believe it was 2007, that the national security letters that give the FBI the ability to just send a letter, like a warrant, saying produce all the records you have on this individual, that individual, and by the way, it's a federal felony if you tell anybody that you got this letter. And the IG did an inspection and ultimately said, eh, there are probably 3,000 or so national security letters that were sent out by the FBI when there was no case, there was no probable cause. They were just doing fishing expeditions. 
that's unconstitutional. And we would have hoped that got cleaned up, but we had an FBI director named Mueller that kept adding to the problems. And instead of punishing the FBI agent that fabricated a case against Ted Stevens as Republican senator, the one that brought forward the fraud by the FBI, he gets run out of the FBI, and the one that was involved in the fraud got promotion, got a better job. So that tells you, even back not long after Mueller took over at the FBI, he was involved in intimidation. And really, I felt it ever since. We know that William Jefferson was a criminal, committed a crime, and was punished as he should have been. But when the FBI under Mueller, he, Mueller made clear, this is intimidation to Congress. You better not mess with me or counter me or have legitimate oversight over what I'm doing, or I may just come search your office. Well, they did. Never been done before that. But it was all about members of Congress concerned about what was happening at the FBI, abuses of our Constitution. So he shoves it right back in our face. It's intimidation. These are Gestapo-type tactics. And there was an article that was written in the Eurasia Review uh, back September 1 of this year, and it expressed the concern I have. It's entitled, The FBI's Gestapo Tactics, Hallmarks of an Author Authoritarian Regime. And it talks about with every passing day, the United States government borrows yet another leaf from the Nazi Germany playbook. Secret police, secret courts, that's we have FISA, and I'm fine if we get rid of them. We, we had national secrets that were kept before FISA, but the abuses and the lack of concern about the abuses by the judges tell me we need to get rid of them. It says secret government agencies, surveillance, censorship, intimidation, harassment, torture, brutality, widespread corruption. And look, if that power's there and Republicans take over and put staunch conservatives in there, you know, we still would need very, very stringent oversight so that nobody did that to the Democrats. Because it, when it happens to one side, it shouldn't concern everybody. I got really upset when I found out about the abuses of the national security letter, and that was under the Bush administration. And I was calling it out. I was angry about it. And I'm not hearing any Democrats concerned about the abuses of the Constitution that have gone on, the intimidation, that borrowing pages directly from the Gestapo. This is how you intimidate people. Well, this is very serious, and I don't have time to go into all of this. It's a good article from the Eurasia Review, but it goes and documents what the Gestapo did and what the FBI is doing, and it's scary. And I hope that if Democrats are not willing to address this issue now, because of the very type of insights that we just heard from her. Thank you. I'm grateful for her service, her intellect, her insights. Um, and especially her pugnacious nature that did not cause her to back down, that caused her to stand up after being a victim herself. Um, I was approached by a lady at a store in Longview, Texas, um, adjoining county to where I was a, a district judge. And she asked if I remembered her, and I didn't. Well, she never testified in court, but 
She said she was there in the courtroom when I sentenced her husband, that she and her daughter had been abused year after year, and her husband had been arrested different times, but he was such a smooth salesman that he always convinced judges to give him a slap on the wrist and probation and be on his way, and that I was the first judge in all those years to be able to see through her husband's great salesmanship and send him to prison. And uh, there's a lot of things that aren't pleasant about being a judge or a justice in that too. But um, to have somebody say, you gave my daughter and me our lives and we're doing great, and she's doing great, and she's going to go to a great college now. Anyway, um, but you got to be able to see through gaslighting. you got to be able to see through lies and get to the facts. Now, uh, we're being told about what a terrible shortage a baby formula there is in this country. And there is, you go in the stores, the shelves have a tremendous shortage. We hear different excuses, but if you had a businessman like President Trump in the White House, when he sees a shortage of something that was needed, he would find out where the problem is he would call the people that could do something about it. Hey, we got to do something about this. And they would figure out a way to get something done about it. Find out where the holdup were, where the problem was. But instead, when there seems to be a shortage or a problem, well, any Republicans say, hey, why aren't we doing something about the baby formula? This gaslighting technique gets used. And then we find out not only is there a, a shortage in the store, but you just shipped truckloads of baby formula to the border, which acts as a draw to more illegal immigration, especially from women with babies or parents with babies to come across and get the baby formula that is not being allowed to go to Americans and American citizens or people that are legally here. And you know, the thought comes of the flights, you know, every week we're in session, flight up here, flight back, we sit through the same presentation over and over again uh, by the flight attendant. Sometimes they do it live. Sometimes they're just going through the motions and there's a tape playing. But they make very clear if we have a problem like the, the fuselage depressurizing, the oxygen mask will drop down and Adults are to put the mask on themselves before they put it on the child. And the reason is rather simple. Because if you put, if you're trying to put your child's mask on and you don't have oxygen, there's a good chance you'll pass out and then both you and your child will die. You get that on yourself and then you will have the oxygen you need to think clearly to make sure your child or children or those dependent upon you can get what they need. Uh, when someone is determined not to provide help to Americans that you're sending all over the world or you're sending as a lure to people to come in illegally, which we heard during our committee hearing. Uh, yes, uh, we do want to make these people into voters that are flooding in 
illegally. That was quite a revelation, although we'd suspected that for some time. But uh, there are consequences to not taking care of the greatest, most philanthropic country in the history of the world that has done more for other people, other nations. Uh, yes, we've had our own problems, but no one has fought racism like was fought here. The most loss of life ever in any war was in the Civil War. Over half a million people died over this issue of slavery. There's no country that has ever fought to end slavery, to end racism the way this country has. I thought we had made tremendous progress. Um, and that was one of the things about the United States Army. You know, I was at the home of the infantry, and you just wanted to make sure that the person next to you was going to be helpful. You weren't concerned about their race or anything like that. You just wanted to make sure that you were going to work together. And it it was quite a good microcosm, even though the, time, the four years I was in, it was not a pleasant time to be in the military. Uh, we were sometimes ordered not to wear our uniform off post because there were people that hated us for wearing a uniform uh, that was post-Vietnam. But with regard to the baby formula, uh, if you keep drawing people into this country, you keep, now we're told we need to pay people to have abortions. You keep taking those actions, um, you will destroy this nation. And once this most philanthropic country in the history of the world is destroyed or converted into some dictatorial Orwellian uh, society, all these countries that we've been able to help since particularly 1789 when the Constitution was ratified, that help is not going to be there. And having heard from people, countries, especially legislatures in parliamentarians in other countries that we consider to be free, they privately will say and have, you have got to protect America's freedom. We see you losing it. And when you lose your freedom in America, there will be no place else to go to have freedom. You're... You're the one that has secured it for the places that have it. This is so important. So when our judiciary and when our executive department of justice abuses people and abuses the system and uses lies instead of truth and uses technology to spy on its citizens, you know, we're in big trouble. And I know when I first got here in January of 05, uh, we Republicans were in the majority. But when it came to civil rights, we had a lot of friends on the other side of the aisle that felt the same way. And there were some on our side who wanted to protect all the power we could give to the Department of Justice. But again, there were people on both sides of the aisle that said this is a threat to our democratic republic. We can't give them this much power. But over the years, after Democrats took the majority in January of 07 through January of 11, and then got it back, we're not getting the kind of help we did those first two years dealing with the abuses within our own you know, ministry of truth uh, because the DOJ really 
using Orwellian terms from 1984, and as I've said before, what we're seeing is the only thing Orwell got wrong was the year. It wasn't 1984, it's now. And it's not called the Ministry of Truth or the Ministry of Love. The Ministry of Love, of course, in 1984, people remember, that was the entity that took people into custody, knocked down doors. They used techniques like our current DOJ does uh, to intimidate people to use much more power than they ever need just to intimidate, you know, like 1984, like a totalitarian government. Um, and I bring that up because I remember in the 1980s, uh, and I had so much respect for the FBI agents I knew, and I'd seen numerous times. I didn't do a lot of criminal work uh, during the 10 years that I was a civil trial lawyer, but they would contact a defendant, uh, a, soon to be a defendant, say, we, are, we got an indictment, we got a warrant, you can either report to the jail at 10 a.m. tomorrow or we'll come get you and you'd much rather come in on your own. Um, if they had a lawyer, they would call the lawyer, have your client come in at 9 or 10 a.m. Not now. Oh, no. Oh, no. We we want uh, the Justice Department, We uh, they want to come in and knock down your door because it's a lot more fun. To, you know, they have the battering ram. And it's a lot more fun to get people in their underwear or maybe in their pajamas that are in bed because you get to scare them and it's easier to intimidate them. What happened to those days when it didn't matter whether the assistant U.S. attorney or the FBI agents voted Democrat or Republican? They were going to make sure they didn't abuse their power. I'm not seeing that kind of concern like I used to see from people in the Department of Justice. I know there's some that feel that way, but yet they're being gaslit if they try to report or be whistleblowers and their careers are destroyed, kind of like uh, Director Mueller destroyed the career of the FBI agent that was a whistleblower and reported the uh, unethical and, I would say, illegal conduct by the FBI in trying to persecute during the prosecution of Ted Stevens when they abused the system and convicted an innocent man. Um, yeah, that, the Mueller way. You, you promote the one that engaged in the, the fraud and you reward or you punish the one who reported the fraud within the FBI. And we've just seen it grow worse and worse as Mueller's very dear friend James Comey took over. The abuses grew. And then Christopher Wray was appointed to clean up the FBI. And it appears to me his way of cleaning things up is just sweep it under the rug. And if somebody lies to the FISA court, commits a crime, whereas if it were a conservative, they would put them under the prison uh, rather than punish, we'll just let him go get a more high-paying job somewhere else. That's not punishment. It's not deterrent. And it is doing massive damage to this country. So we have the Ministry of Truth now called the Disinformation Board that's been created. And this is being led and created by people who have been champions of disinformation, champions of gaslighting, who want to convince America, if you think there's a problem, if you think there's abuse in the FISA court, if you think there was any improprieties in elections, then we need to come after you and charge you with disinformation. Uh, and just like for those of you who have not read 1984 or don't remember, uh, the Ministry of Truth, in this case uh, now called the Disinformation Board, they were charged with rewriting history every day. And as Orwell pointed out, 
through, I believe his name was Winston. Um, on one day, they might say, well, this government did not invent the airplane, but all of the good changes that have made it more effective, more efficient, faster, those came by our great big brother government. And then you, eventually you would get to the point where you would just forget all of that and say, big brother government created the airplane, has had everything to do with making it effective and just take credit for everything good and then blame everybody else for anything bad. So that seems like where we're going. We could call it the gaslighting board, but it's called the disinformation board. And it's headed by a person who herself has been quite guilty of disinformation. And yet she's going to be in charge of coming up with disinformation for the future, apparently. And we can expect problems ahead for sure. Um, and now, this article from May 12th, yesterday, from the New York Post, uh, Nina Jankowitz says verified Twitter users should edit others' tweets. I mean, we're right out of 1984, uh, going back to the days of the 50s, when some songwriter wrote, if your mommy is a commie, well, you got to turn her in. Um, this is where it appears the disinformation board wants to go. Uh, yeah, kids, turn in your parents. Uh, if you find out that they've said anything privately at home that is inconsistent with the new truth that the disinformation board has come up with, uh, this, is, this is dangerous stuff. It, 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 it cannot be overstated. We have got to stop the disinformation board. The solution to misinformation is more freedom so that people that have accurate information can come out with it. But when the government puts its finger on the scales of justice, on the balance, then you can be assured you're going to get less truth and less justice because it's not going to be fair you know i mentioned before i was an exchange student for a summer to the old soviet union and from what i understood uh you know it, it was the soviet government it was the communist party they put out all this misinformation and they would lie about things. They would cover up. Still wonder how many cosmonauts may have died during their space program, but they never came out truthfully with what all happened. But um, I was with a couple of Soviet college students who I liked a great deal. They were wonderful people. And we were going looking at an exhibit about some of the space program things. And you know, Gagarin was the first human ever in space. Um, and there were some entries about Gagarin and the world hero that he was. And up to that point, I felt like, well, these are college students who would be the most likely to get upset if they were lied to. And it said something about Gagarin being killed uh, testing a new experimental plane. And the Soviet college friend, Mail, said, uh, yeah, right, well, that's, he spoke terrific English. He said, yeah, well, we know that's not true. And I was intrigued. You know, I'd never not heard them indicate that they knew they were being lied to by the Soviet government. And the other Soviet college student said, yeah, there's no way that happened. And I said, you don't believe he was killed testing a plane as a test pilot? And they both chimed in, no, there's no way. He was the greatest hero in the history of the world, the first man in space. There is no way the Soviet government would allow him 
to get into a plane by himself that wasn't safe. That didn't happen. It was too important. He was too important as a hero, as, as someone that made us admire our government. They wouldn't let him die like that. Well, I didn't know whether he died as a test pilot or not, but I was intrigued that they believed to their core that the Soviet government lied to them. Why? Because the Soviet government constantly lied to them. They would make up lies. In fact, I remember this was 1973, found it interesting in Pravda, they were reporting some things about Watergate emerging back in the U.S., and because it really was like a disinformation board or ministry of truth, whichever one you want to call it, they made everything about the Soviet Union. Everything was centered on the Soviet Union. So their take on Watergate was that because Richard Nixon came to the Soviet Union, the first president ever to do so, that's why the Democrats came after him and were wanting to throw him out of office or put him in jail because he made friends with the Soviets. Well, that was their take in order to make it all about the Soviet Union. And of course, we know crimes were committed and the cover-up was the worst of it. But um, this is where we're headed. And it's a very dangerous time. We do not need a disinformation board we need people being able to stand up and speak up without intimidation because they're conservative black or because they are abused or whatever. They need to be able to speak up and to bring evidence forward or at least have an investigation to get to the bottom of things without being belittled, without being gaslit, and that will do more to secure our freedom for the future. And with that, I yield back. There was a quote from John Adams as a follow-up to what my friend from Arizona, Mr. Swikert, was saying. Uh, he had great exchanges with his friend, then his enemy, and then his friend again for the rest of their lives, Thomas Jefferson. And John Adams said, there are two ways to conquer and enslave a country. One is by the sword, the other is by debt. And I appreciate my friend yielding. Uh, this will likely be the last speech that I will be able to give from the House floor. I can imagine there are people clapping all over that are watching C-SPAN. But it's been a tremendous honor to serve in this hallowed body. Um, it, it just has. This was not something that I aspired to from my earliest days, and in fact, I really didn't want to be a judge after my mother got over the disappointment of my, not, my choosing not to apply to med school, um, and then she got used to the idea of having an attorney. She ended up... Um, through the 80s, she knew she had a brain tumor that was going to ultimately take her life. They had done what they could at Mayo Clinic and surgery. Um, they could do no more. Uh, but she was brilliant. She put herself through Baylor in about two and a half years uh, while she was working full time, most of that in the registrar's office. But my brilliant mom taught school as eighth grade English teacher for so many years and taught Sunday school for most of her years. Uh, but she would say, Louie, you know, you'd make a great judge. And go, Mother, I don't want to be a judge. Um, you know, uh, there's some lawyers I'd, I'd hate to sit there and listen to all day. And besides, I make more money than a judge does. I, I don't got no interest. We lost her in uh, January of 1991. And... After that, I'd been thinking about what my brilliant mother used to say. Um, and a few months later, I had a judge call me and ask if my female client would go out with him uh, before her trial. It was a civil trial on a breach contract. And I told him, basically, I couldn't help him. 
but I knew we needed a new judge. So I tried for months to find somebody that would run against him and uh, talk to all kinds of Republican lawyers that I thought had been considering nobody would step up. By Thanksgiving, had to file around the 1st of December. My wife and I both just had this piece. This is what I was supposed to do, was run for judge. So I did, and as the most politically astute person in our county, Republican that is, told me that the night before the primary election, uh, he said, you know, I didn't, nobody gave you a snowball's chance of winning because, you know, this guy was the first Republican elected in the county. In fact, I had Republican leaders that said, look, we know it's not great, but, and there were some issues there, but he was the first Republican elected in our county, and we just feel like we owe him the job. Well, nobody's owed a public service job. So, um, at Thanksgiving, we had this piece. This is what I'm supposed to do, win or lose, ran and ended up not just squeaking by as was predicted the day before and a 50-50 chance of winning, one with 70% of the vote. After years on the bench, uh, I just had this feeling, I applied the law as it was, whether I liked it or not, um, but that I, ought to, I need to go change some of these laws, try to change some of them, uh, and then I had the invitation from Governor Perry to an appointment to be Chief Justice of the Court of Appeals there. And uh, I thought, well, perhaps this is a way to finish my career on the bench. My wife thought so after we prayed about it, contemplated. And then it, when I finished that term, Governor Perry wanted to provide another appointment to the appellate bench. And said, no, I think I'm supposed to run for Congress. So I did and got elected. We have won with 70 to 80 percent of the vote uh, in the, uh, ever since. So what I thought was, you know, this country is in trouble. And maybe I can go help get this country on track. Maybe I can make a difference. After one term, Newt Gingrich, we lost the majority November of 2006. After I'd been here two years, I was talking to Newt Gingrich about it. And he said, I've heard you. You ought to be on the floor every day talking about these issues. We've got two hours of special orders every, every day. And I thought maybe so, and I took it to heart. And since then, yes, I've given a lot of special orders talking about the issues that I think are critically important. Um, <laughs> when the Democrats took the majority back, uh, my Democrat friend, hope that doesn't hurt his reelect, but John Garamundi said, Louie, we just voted on the new rules of the House and we passed the Gomert resolution. I said, what does that mean, John? He said, uh, it means you can no longer have but <laughs> multiple special orders in one week. You can only have one. That's the new Gomert rule informally. That's what some of us call it. Because we don't want to hear you every, every night. Because I told the cloakroom years ago, Look, if somebody's not going to take our time to talk about these issues, and yeah, there's usually not much anybody around here on the House floor, but as Newt said, you may have 200,000 to 4 million people watch C-SPAN different times. You never know how many you're going to watch, but you can make a difference if you talk about what's important. So I told the cloakroom years ago, look, if somebody's not going to take our time I'll get my tie back on and come back over there and take it. So that's what I've done. 18 years later, this country is in deeper trouble than it was when I got here. I know having gotten my degree in history and never stopped studying history, so many great stories, profound stories about our history. 
And I know my daughters have suffered you know, abuse from people because they were my daughters. Not that they agreed with me on everything, but um, in fact, we have disagreements, but I love them. And I didn't, never meant for them to suffer. But uh, recently I read a sermon that per was prepared by Pastor Tommy Nelson in Texas. Well, there was a governor, Thomas Nelson of Virginia, who was a, a commander back during the Revolution. 1781, Yorktown is surrounded. General Lafayette comes over and says, uh, General, uh, Governor, where should we fire first with our cannons? And Governor Nelson, General Nelson, he knew that the British command was in his home. They'd taken his home. They made it his command, their command center. And he told Lafayette, right there, my house. There were some reportedly that said, we didn't want to fire at that. It's your house. And he said, that's where the enemy is. That's where you got to fire. And cannonball after cannonball went through his home. The founders suffered so much, gave so much, many with their lives. You look at the 56 signers, the Declaration of Independence, they suffered immeasurably. Many of them forfeited their lives for the cause of freedom. But John Adams, in one of his letters to Jefferson, toward the end of his life, he said, the general principles on which the fathers, I'm about the founding fathers, achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. I will avow that I then believed and I now believe that those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God. John Jay himself, one of the authors of the Federalist Papers, Supreme Court Justice, uh, our nation's actually first Chief Justice, he wrote in his own handwriting, the Bible is the best of all books, for it's the Word of God, teaches us the way to be happy in this world and in the next. Continue, therefore, to read it and to regulate your life by its precepts. Back to John Adams, he said, the jaws of power are always open to devour, and her arm is always stretched out, if possible, to destroy the freedom of thinking, speaking, and writing. Boy, he, he was so astute and wise. He said, democracy will soon degenerate into anarchy, such anarchy that every man will do what is right in his own eyes, and no man's life or property or reputation or liberty will be secure. It was so true. He saw what happens even in the few democracies or republics that have ever existed. I think ours is not just a republic, but a form of democratic republic where we elect our representatives instead of like ancient Greeks, Athens, where they actually had everybody participate in the big decisions. So I do have a heavy heart. I see what's going on. We had a hearing today on uh, regarding mass shootings. Witnesses, Sandy Hook from Uvalde. And they're saying we got to get rid of the guns, like getting rid of spoons would get rid of obesity. The problem is not with our Second Amendment right. It is exactly what John Adams pointed out. He said, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, revenge, or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. And then he said, our Constitution was designed for a moral and religious 
people, it is wholly inadequate for the governing of any others. Our problem is very clear to me. It's not with weapons. It's with the lack of morality. It's exactly what uh, President Adams said over 200 years ago. He saw it. If you're not teaching children that there is absolute right and wrong, there may be gray areas, there are, as every lawyer would tell you, but, but there are some absolutes that are right or wrong. And as God, those of us who believe the Bible, God made clear that the children of Israel were to teach their children, keep the verses of Scripture around all the time, put them on your doorpost. Uh, and I knew that. I'd seen the Scripture. But first time I was King David Hotel in Jerusalem, I said, what are these little tubes on the door? Uh, well, they were verses of Scripture. They took it literally. You need to have those verses everywhere. Teach your children. And we have not done that. So after people like Bill Ayers, Weather Underground, violent hippies, uh, after they had tried to push us into a Marxist uh, country or make us one, uh, and they had no success whatsoever, the violence didn't help, they realized the way to go is to go into the universities, get tenure, and in the meantime, be teaching future teachers that Marxism is a good idea. Whether you call it socialism, progressivism, I change the name, call it progressivism. Still Marxism. But as Dostoevsky said in response to this nut named Marx in the 1800s, he said the problem with Marxism is not economic. We know that's a huge problem. It's always going to fail. But the problem with Marxism is atheism because the government has to become God. That's what he was meaning. And that has for so many people become God. And as I came here thinking, you know, gosh, if we could just get enough members of Congress to stand up for what's right and preserve our freedoms, I ultimately have realized Congress as upset as people are at Congress, and we write very poorly in the polls, Congress is a reflection of this country. You don't like what's going on in Congress? Well, it's a reflection of what's going on in the country. This House is the only elected body I'm aware of in the whole country where you can only get there by being elected. Senators, senator leaves or dies, they can be appointed or elect, elected either one, but normally they're appointed to fill until the election. This body, you can't get in here as a member unless you've been elected. Adam said, cities may be rebuilt and a people reduced to poverty may require may acquire fresh property, but a constitution of government once changed from freedom can never be restored. Liberty once lost is lost forever. When the people once surrendered their share in the legislature and their right of defending the limitations on government and of resisting every encroachment upon them, they can never regain it. If we want Congress to be better, the country's got to become better because we're headed toward Mar Marxism. And, and many realize that. If you looked at the original Black Lives Matter, and it was never about black lives. It was about moving toward Marxism. At one of their tenets, they took it off, one of their goals, eliminating Western-style marriage. You know, Western-style marriage? We don't have Western-style marriage. Moses said, God told him, a man shall leave his father and mother, woman lead her home, and the two will become one. That's marriage. And it was for procreation of the nation of Israel and for the people. And civilizations that lasted have, been, have based 
their growth on that societal building block, the family. And then you had Jesus. When asked about marriage and particularly divorce, he quoted Moses verbatim, man shall leave his father and mother, woman leave her home, two will become one flesh. And then he's the one that added, and what God has joined together, let no one put asunder or separate. But this body, just this month, we've come in here. Now that we have a, a majority that is much wiser, it's a bipartisan majority that's wiser than Moses and Jesus. Um, we said, no, 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 we'll tell you what marriage is. And so churches that supported that, they're going to find out. Uh, you either become woke or the United States government is going to come destroy your entity. Church, school, that's where it headed. Perhaps the Supreme Court will protect us. Maybe it won't. But I still hear Justice Scalia. We were having lunch, and he said, you know, you guys have the ultimate power. You can stop anything. You've got the power of the purse. You don't like something, you can kill it. Just cut off all the funding. So don't come running over across the street to us just because you don't have the nerve to do what you think should be done. Come run to us. You didn't do, do what you got the power to do. And we haven't done that. Easier to hope maybe the Supreme Court will take care of it. Adams also said, remember, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. There was never democracy or democratic republic here yet that did not commit suicide. But he says, be not intimidated nor suffer yourselves to be wheedled out of your liberties by any pretext of politeness, delicacy, or decency. These, as they are often used, are but three different names for hypocrisy, chicanery, and cowardice. And it is, and I mentioned this when I was reading Tommy Nelson's sermon, but Alexis de Tocqueville in the 1830s and 40s, he said, upon my arrival in the United States, the religious aspect of the country was the first thing that struck my attention. And the longer I stayed there, the more I perceived the great political consequences resulting from this new state of things to which I was unaccustomed. He said, in France, I had almost always seen the spirit of religion and the spirit of freedom marching in opposite directions. But in America, I found they were intimately united and that they reigned in common over the country. He talked about our founders. Forget 1619, whatever. Um, he says... He's talking about founders. They brought with them a form of Christianity. Yes, some people pushed slavery, but Thomas Jefferson in that original Declaration of Independence, he had one of the grievances was against King George forever allowing slavery to get started because he saw the damage it was doing to America and to the people that were involved. But Alexis de Tocqueville said, they brought with them, our founders, a form of Christianity, which I cannot better describe than by styling it as a democratic and republican religion. From the earliest settlement of the immigrants, politics and religions contracted an alliance which has never been dissolved until recent history. He didn't live to see what's going on now. And look, you know, some of us get beat up. We do believe a woman has every right and should make all the decisions concerning her body. She does. She should. That's the way it should be. And she has every right to make decisions for that unborn child in her that she's carrying. But if a decision is made 
to kill that other body, that's normally when government gets involved. Because we're supposed to protect the most vulnerable among us. Some people continue to try to say, gee, you know, we didn't see Christianity mentioned in the Constitution. Of course, the Declaration of Independence mentions um, their, our Creator and also, you know, nature's God. But, uh, and actually, if you look at the way the Constitution was signed, it was signed in the year of our Lord, 1787. Uh, yeah, that's the way they dated it. And that date, I mean, it's amazing. Some people say, well, it's unconstitutional to, to sign anything with that date if it's government. Well, if it's signed like the Constitution is signed, I don't see how it can be unconstitutional. But there was um, First Presbytery of the Eastward, a group of clergy from Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and they wanted Christianity to be mentioned in the Constitution. But they wrote a letter and, and they declared that as they see, because of Washington's piety and his support for Christian morality, which really is Judeo, but that morality that they see that we're in good hands. Oh, okay. It hadn't been 25 minutes, but I guess it was inaccurate what I was given. So thank you. You don't always get the truth here, but you did today. Thank you.